I'm very pleased to be here and introduce Jonathan Wurtson, who is Associate Professor of Sociology and History. His research engages a set of related thematic areas that include empire and colonialism, state formation and non-state forms of political organization, ethnicity and nationalism, and religion and social political action. His work focuses largely on society and politics in North Africa and the Middle East, particularly with regards to interactions catalyzed by the expansion of European empires into this region in the 19th and 20th centuries. His first book is Making Morocco, Colonial Intervention and the Politics of Identity, published in 2015 and it won the 2016 Social Science History Association's President's Book Award. His second book is the one we're here to talk about today, World Making in the Long Great War, How Local and Colonial Struggles Shaped the Modern Middle East, just published in 2022 by Columbia University Press. And you have an opportunity today to purchase signed copies of Professor Wardson's book, um, available at the Yale Bookstore. I'm going to put the link in the chat and I will continue to do so a few times throughout the presentation today because I really encourage you to get a signed copy of the book. Um, and to, I also like to tell you that uh, our presenters do this as a way to enrich the Yale community. They do not get paid to give these presentations. Um, they do them out of the generosity of their intellectual spirit and I think it's important that we support them in exchange by purchasing a copy of their book. So I really encourage you to um, follow the link and order your signed copy of Professor Wardson's book. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Jonathan, to give your presentation. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thanks to all of you for showing up this afternoon or whatever time of day it is where you are. Um, it's really uh, a pleasure to be able to be able to talk about this uh, topic. Uh, this is something I've been working on a long time. I saw some of my students that are in the chat too um, that took took a class with me or a couple of classes where we really were talking about um, some of these these questions over time and and it's uh, it's really a great opportunity to get to talk about it to a larger audience and I, I'm gonna try to give you an overview of the book today and then leave plenty of time for questions. Um, an, an interactive kind of session there at the end. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, got some maps and I have a lot of uh, photographs and maps that will hopefully help flesh this story, flesh this story out for you. Um, so today we're talking about this question of the origins of the modern Middle East. And uh, just as, as Lauren mentioned, um, my previous work where, where I come to this from is having um, uh, originally actually studied abroad as an undergrad. Uh, I was at the University of Texas at Austin and I studied abroad in uh, Israel at the University of Haifa and kind of uh, was exposed to the Israel-Palestine issue at that point in my life and then um, and was first kind of drawn into these questions. I then, after a period of kind of studying that Israel-Palestine questions in, in a master's program, ended up uh, spending time in North Africa and Morocco specifically, and in my PhD work uh, focused on Morocco. And I got drawn to these just kind of a nexus of questions that have to do with how empire has impacted this region, kind of the greater Middle East, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and so that book was really looking at the question of identity and how the, uh, the experience of living under a colonial state in Morocco set up these conflicts uh, about the eth ethno-linguistic identity, about religious identity, the role of the monarchy, and also the space of what Morocco was on um, this kind of territorial uh, dimension of the conflict. Uh, in ways that, in that colonial period, the, the kind of through line is that these uh, colonial uh, episodes set up tensions or debates and struggles over identity that then have a legacy moving forward into the post-colonial history up to the present. So this is kind of the, the really the, my research interests really sit on that. It's like what happens with colonial intervention and then what the legacies uh, are of, of those interactions. Um, so today we're looking at this, this question of World War I, which is a, 
uh, epical, uh, epochal kind of moment, uh, a big bang almost, a kind of a, a, a huge event that transforms the region from Morocco to Iran and, uh, you know, giving you just an overview of what's driving, the driving question in this book and then what uh, it's doing in terms of trying to come up with an alternate narrative. So let's dive right into that. Basically, to give you, you know, a quick roadmap, start with the central question is, what is the Genesis story of the modern Middle East? What is the book arguing against? Uh, and this is a standard narrative that I think is the intuitive one. We'll get into that. And I think it's, it might be, it was my own sort of understanding of the region. And I think it might be what you would be more, most familiar with. Uh, looking at how, what I'm pro proposing as an alternate narrative, uh, this idea of a long great war and what that means and uh, and like what it means in terms of the actual content of, of an alternate narrative, but also like the implications of that, the bigger picture, um, which is kind of getting down to what I was mentioning, this like longer relevance and the ways that the region now, a hundred years after these events, is still really uh, in a, a moment in which these questions remain on the table and, and I have some thoughts. Uh, I'm not going to solve, uh, if anybody's might be disappointed with this, but I'm not going to solve the longstanding tensions in the region completely today. But I just have some thoughts about how we can rethink them and, and hopefully um, rethink them in ways that get beyond a, a kind of intractable, um, timeless conflict that really can't go anywhere, which is a lot, the way that a lot of these questions uh, in the region can be understood. So start off with the driving question again, how was the modern Middle East and North Africa made? What was the, the genesis story here? And here to kind of just visualize this, you could look at the political map of the region in from, a, you know, this is a, a map that ranges from the early, from the 1400s really up through the eve of World War I. But over 400 years, you have a basic political order in the region that if you start from the west, which is on the far edge of this map, you have a Moroccan dynasty, the Alawites that forge, and there's a succession of dynasties, and the most, the latest of these from the, seven, the 1660s forges a, a polity out there, the Alawite Empire. The Ottomans in the middle forge an empire that spans from the Balkans, Anatolia, southern shores of the Mediterranean, and most of, you know, up, up against the Torah, sorry, the Zagros Mountains, uh, which is the border with modern day border with Iran and then to the east of there, that last empire, the Safavid Empire. So you have three big Muslim empires that are shaping the political order of this zone from Morocco to Iran. And then by the mid 20th century, uh, if not earlier, you have this map, which is broken down into an interstate system of uh, these disparate uh, polities. So how do you get from there to there? You know what that the question to be explained is: How does the modern Middle East, with this map of an interstate, kind of an inter, a nation state, if you will, model of a political order, how does that come to be? So, before explaining how I think that happened, I wanted to start. I think it's important to start with a reference to what the book is arguing against. And here, what I want to kind of lay out for you, and um, spend a little bit of time, kind of uh, laying out the target or the what I'm arguing against, uh, which I have shorthanded, I've kind of put a, a label over this as the Sykes-Picot standard narrative. Sykes-Picot is a specific ref reference that I'll, I'll talk about in a second, but I'm using this as a bigger marker over a, a broader interpretation and explanation of how that map changes. So first, the basis of this narrative is oriented around wartime, meaning during World War I, and post-war agreements and treaties. A lot of these, I mean, all of these agreements and treaties involve the British. So the British are involved in 1915 and 1916, and is corresponding with a, uh, a leader in Mecca, Sharif Hussein, who they are trying to get to stage a revolt against the Ottomans in the middle of the war. And as a quid pro quo, they say, and they make promises, and there's some ambiguity here, uh, but they promise that after the war, they will support the establishment of an Arab kingdom. It'll be under British protection, but there will be an Arab kingdom in the Arab speaking provinces, the Ottoman Empire. The second 
agreement or the second direction of these promises is really oriented around the British and the French, but it's important to note that the Russians and Italians are involved in this. Also, this is the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which I'm referring to. So in 1916, Mark Sykes, the British uh, representative in Georges Picot, the French one, uh, and then with dialogue with Russian colleagues, if you think the Al in World War One, the British, the French, and the Russians are fighting uh, against the Axis powers, uh, the sorry, the Central powers, uh, they're trying to get Italy in, they're trying to uh, encourage the Russians. Um, and so one thing that they're doing is deciding in the midst of the war what they might do if they win and the Ottoman Empire is on the table. And they promise uh, the zone uh, that's blue and then A is a French zone of control, the pink zone in the bottom is British. The green zone, which doesn't usually always, or doesn't always come into explanation of Sykes Pico, is an Italian zone in southern Anatolia. And then the Russians are going to take the eastern Anatolia and the prize of the Straits of Bosphorus and Istanbul or Constantinople, which is both as symbolically important because the Russians view themselves as the heirs of the Byzantine Empire and the Orthodox uh, Church uh, patriarchy that, that is there. In addition to the fact that even right now with the Ukraine-Russian war, the straits that link the Black Sea to the Mediterranean are, are a timeless uh, strategic priority for, for Russia, which lacks a warm water ports. Um, the next agreement that's part of this narrative, kind of this litany of agreement, agreements that set up the story, the origin story of the modern Middle East, is a promise that the British make in the midst of the war in November 1917 to the uh, Zionist movement that says that the British are going to support the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine, uh, which on the Sykes-Picot map is actually was going to be an international zone. Um, but the British are supporting that uh, the establishment of the Jewish national home there, which um, then in the Paris Peace Conference, these three agreements are interacting. And at the end of the day, what goes into the Treaty of Sev, which is the uh, post-war Paris uh, treaty that is between the Allied powers and the Ottoman Empire. It basically mainly it gives up half of at least of the first promise in the British Hussein, the Hussein McMahon. It honors the Sykes-Picot if you take out the Russians uh, because of the Russian Revolution, they drop out of the war. And it honors the Balfour Declaration. Um, and this, uh, then there's kind of like, oh, but wait a second, there's a quota in, in terms of this, this narrative, is that the Turkish... Uh, part of that map up there got reworked because the Turkish independence movement uh, was successful and actually forced the British and the French back to the negotiating table at Lausanne and in 1923. Then you really get, that's the end. That's the end of the story. That's the creation of the modern Middle East. Okay, I this is a very powerful uh, and a very widespread um, narrative. This is basically the way that most people understand it. Whether you're uh, at the specialist level at, or at the popular level. And here's one example some of you have probably read this book. I read it back when I was um, first learning about the region. It's fantastically written. Um, but uh, in, in some ways, uh, this what what I work on in, in this book is a long response to Fromkin's sort of masterpiece um, and arguing against what he's saying here. But basically, if you look at that quote there, right? Middle Eastern personalities are not a big deal. They're not at the table. It's Europeans and Americans that draw lines on an empty map, invent... Uh, the, the, the different polities in the modern Middle East. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm taking on the task of actually really critiquing this. And, and the, the whole point of this book is to replace this narrative with what I think is what really happened. And that's where we're headed. But just to kind of get some more evidence of the, uh, just the ubiquity almost of this narrative that the Sykes-Picot sort of dominating standard narrative, uh, which is, you know, to sum it up, the British and the French, the British are the primary agent, the French are kind of a supporting character. Uh, after the war, divide up the post-Ottoman map amongst themselves, impose artificial and arbitrary boundaries on the region. And here's, this is important, that these are the original sin of the subsequent conflicts, the subsequent tensions that are part of the region. Um, so. Just to give you a couple more examples, if you just go on Amazon, uh, for instance, there's you know, a book from a little while ago, Empire of Sand, How Britain Made the Middle East. Um, 
it's the same thing. It's a unilateral uh, or kind of and also a, a single causal story where the British and again, kind of maybe the French come into a, a degree, but the F British made the modern Middle East uh, in this in the post-war uh, agreement. And then a recent book from Yale University Press. I haven't had a chance to read this. I think it's going to be fantastic. And it is one of the first books to take on the Cairo uh, conference in 1921. But here again, it's the British are the center of the story and that agreement in 1921, maybe it's not Sykes-Picot, but it's now the Cairo conference that makes the modern Middle East. Um, more In a more popular level, back in the day when uh, John Stewart was uh, running The Daily Show and John Oliver would come on with his guest appearance, this is a story of uh, John Oliver's playing Sir Mapsalot, who is a gin or whiskey swilling British colonial official who's just squiggling on the map and creating the modern Middle East. This is at the height of the kind of the midst of the Iraq war. And it's a critique of the way that Western powers are oblivious of on the ground realities and, and draw arbitrary lines. Again, almost a quote, betwixt and between these tribal allegiances or ethnic allegiances. And again, the diagnosis, that's the original sin um, for the present and that the US is engaged in this again. On another level, this is the Islamic State in 1940, sorry, in 2014, at the border between Iraq and Syria, staging a kind of theatrical uh, dem demolition of the Sykes-Picot border, physically going through a berm on that border and uh, releasing a video called The End of Sykes-Picot. This is hard. I'm, I've had to take on this narrative. And what's hard about it is that this is a very intuitive a very clear, legible kind of sequence that you can, I can literally, I can, I could have done it in like 30 seconds, um, that, that lays out this story and it also has a moral valence to it. What went wrong? What's going, why is, it, is are, are these tensions there, these conflicts in the region? And it's just real clear why that happened, uh, the standard narrative. So to start to move towards the other side, what's wrong with the Sykes-Picot narrative? Um, so first, I'm a historian, a sociological historian or a historical sociologist. So as a historian, what's wrong with it is that it's not actually accurate. And now what I want to do uh, is, is empirically, historically, it does not reflect what happened in, in the region on the ground. So if we look, if you take accounts in the early 1920s, the actual map of the modern, of the Middle East that's happening right then, that's emerging, is if you, uh, kind of survey it from the east to the west or from the west to the east is there's a plurality, there's an explosion of a whole bunch of what I'm you know, generically referring to as polities. I'm not saying these are nations, they're not states necessarily, they're not nation states for sure. Um, there's emerging local experiments like the Reef Republic in northern Morocco and Tripoli in, in yeah, western Libya. There's a, a short-lived two, two years of an, a triple Italian Republic. In the Arabian Peninsula you have multiple uh, political projects that are, are being engaged there, one of which is emerging out of the Najd. Uh, this, we're going to talk about this later the, with Ibn Saud. Um, and uh, in eastern Anatolia, in the border between, uh, you know, in the Zagros Mountains down across the border between Turkey and Iran now, Iraq and Iran, uh, there are Kurdish polities that are emerging there, or, or ideas about that. Not to mention the diversity of opinions about uh, Palestine, what is uh, Trench, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria. So factually, the uh, facts on the ground at this point in the 1920s encompass this huge plurality of different uh, polities here and also conflict. And so the Paris Peace Conference, this is really like the question that was driving me as I come to this kind of backwards, having thought about the Moroccan case and looked at that Reef Republic, which throughout the 1920s is a engaged in a uh, serious warfare against the, Brit the French protectorate and the Spanish protectorate. Um, the Paris Peace Conference was, the, was supposed to create this peace settlement uh, that settled the Middle East. If you actually look at the region, it's very unsettled and you have warfare rather than a kind of a peace time. You have a war time that continues well into the 1920s. Um, and so to account for that, um, is it, one of the things like this, this project, trying to figure out is how you account for what's really happening there. So I, I really narrowed down these fatal flaws of the Sykes because standard narrative to the following points. One of them is it commits what I call a judicial fallacy, which be 
uh, that it assumes that having an agreement or having a treaty means that that equals reality in the ground. And the map before, I was just trying to give you a hint of the fact that you can come up with an agreement in Paris or in London or you know Geneva, but that does not mean that it directly translates into reality on the ground. So secondly, it assumes the narrative kind of backwards engineers and just goes back and assumes that the political t containers and boundaries that happen to succeed afterward were actually present back at this point. Instead of seeing them as an outcome that's emerging and you have to explain. Um, I'll, we're going to be talking about that quite a bit. Another thing that it does, it assumes that these boundaries, uh, these containers were imposed and therefore artificial. And this is really important because it has to do with the legitimacy of the new states that are in the region up to the present. Um, I mean, again, we're going to talk a lot about this idea of factually they weren't imposed. It's going to be something we're talking about. And then also the whole presumptions about artificiality or the opposite, something that is natural or a given. Uh, I, you know, just to put, put a point in now, I'm going to keep hammering this. That idea, and I just say it here, is it's a, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the Middle East and a kind of unfair exceptionalization of it to assume that there were natural post-Ottoman containers that should have been created that weren't. We're going to talk more about that. that and probably we'll talk about that a lot in the Q&A. But effectively, I want you to just be open to the idea that the idea of any polity, of any nation state, of any country being necessary and natural is actually historically inaccurate. And that every country in the world is a product of contention and, and also a historical process. That's really the whole point of this talk is that the modern Middle East is formed through process, not through uh, an event, an opposed event. Um, the Sykes-Picot standard narrative ignores uh, what kind of I mentioned, the historical fact that the map was fluid and dynamic well past the date of Sykes-Picot for sure, but definitely also 1920, the, Par the Paris Peace Conference treaties. Um, it also ignores what I just mentioned, that all political spaces are produced over time through historical process and often through violent processes. The title of the book is World Making in War. Um, and finally, I mean, sorry, second to last, it assumes, this is connected to that, that local actors and colonial actors had fixed preferences. That the British had this idea in 1916 about dividing up the region between the French and the British, and they just did that. They didn't recalculate. They didn't have to change what they wanted. And similarly, on the local side, that there was an idea that Zionists wanted this, the Arabs wanted this, the Turks wanted this, the Kurds wanted this, and that those were fixed, that they weren't dynamic and changing. And what the book does is traces the fact of how quickly and how pragmatically people are, uh, are adjusting what they want to do as history happens, as, as the, the region is going through war and certain things become thinkable and th then they become unthinkable. And then finally, um, this is something that's important, is that it's a, the, that, that narrative selects just on one small part of the Middle East, it's a very important part, but basically the former Arab provinces of greater Syria and Mesopotamia and says that that's the story of the whole of the modern Middle East. I mentioned I started coming from the Morocco side, so the way I was seeing this is actually from a broader canvas. And I think once you bring in that broader canvas, you have to rethink the overarching narrative and you can't tell it just through the Sykes-Picot logics. Okay, what's the alternative? Uh, here, what I'm proposing is a long, great war framework for understanding this. First. Think about World War I, which most of us, myself included, we think through through the Western Front. We, th we see it as a, uh, from a particular part of the war, which is the Western European theater. We don't even usually think a lot about the Eastern Europe or the Balkans on this. Historians have been really pushing to open that up. And um, secondly, definitely not seeing World War I from the perspective of the Middle East. But this book is a kind of methodologically assuming that the vantage point is the Middle East. And if you do that, it's important to uh, first have a long war. And here, what I'm arguing in the book is that you can't think of 1914 as a um, start date. And I'll talk about why 1911 is the appropriate gate date. The end of the war is also very much not 1918, because you have active war for that it continues to 1934. So a long war, uh, geography. And here, uh, what I was talking about before is open up the aperture and see the war from a broader perspective, 
than just uh, the the Eastern Mediterranean, but see the whole a greater modern the, the greater Middle East rather from the Atlantic coast to the Iranian plateau. And here, uh, what the book does is kind of get into the ways that the the connectivity between the Atlantic Mediterranean Red and Persian Red Sea and Persian Gulf to the Indian Ocean, uh, and also the Black Sea. The system of waterways, which are geostrategically important through all of human history, basically, and the land masses that are involved in that, is a system that we need to think of as a whole, and then under think about variation within that system about what's happening through this really tumultuous period that's transforming the political order there. The other thing that's really important is instead of against the emphasis on wartime agreements or peace treaties. This is a narrative that emphasizes a kind of a sociological or like an on the ground reality of war and violence. And that that is the driving kind of engine that's uh, reshaping the political reality realities in the region, not the peace settlement. Here, I break this down into war, unmakes the Ottoman Empire, unmakes the Qajar Empire in Iran or uh, dynasty. And it really unmakes the Alawites in Morocco, even though they are retained in the French uh, and Spanish protectorates there. Um, World War One and World War Two, but you could look at other examples in, in the 19th and even 18th century, is these global wars are particularly important in unmaking and remaking large parts of the world. So we can talk about perhaps later uh, about the broader kind of uh, maybe implications. Uh, also, re war remakes how we think about political identity. Ottoman identity becomes over time completely unthinkable. You know, it's, we could talk about it more, but uh, new identities become thinkable, and it's war that's reshaping that uh, the futures that are plausible, even. And what you again, it's not like you have a timeless uh, political identity that can't uh, dynamically change and adjust. This is dr this is actually being recalculated and reimagined through this period. And then finally, because this is something that actually is usually precedence, is the first uh, issue that we talk about is like the borders are drawn incorrectly, uh, and it's the imposition uh, of a Sykes-Picot agreement or a Treaty of Sev that does that. I'm saying no, it's war that actually makes borders. And honestly, war, the border, the boundaries are actually a derivative or a secondary effect of the state making and some of the identity struggles that are happening. And that is definitely counterintuitive for the ways that we usually think about the region. Okay. So I'm going to just get you in, into the flow and in, in the time we have. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be watching. I am watching the clock. Um, but I want to get you into the meat of that, of this narrative flow. And I break down the Long Great War into these three parts. The first one is the unmaking stage. Uh, that's from 1911 to 1918. The, a moment in the middle of this long... And, this is a period of sustained warfare, and it does change the type of war uh, changes. But in this middle period, there's a window that opens for colonial powers are thinking, what are we going to do in the region? Uh, but local people at different groups are also thinking about pop, uh, possible futures they can have there. This starts to narrow down by the mid-1920s, and that last part of the book is 1924 to 1934 is focused on large-scale intense military conflicts that happen across that map from Morocco to Iran. Okay, so let's dive in on the, uh, the these different parts here. First, unmaking the Ottoman order. I start the story in kind of going back in time a little bit to draw this up to the present, uh, up until the crisis, rather, of World War I. Um, the first thing is, and this is, would be familiar to, to many of you, is that, and it's, it's something that actually is important for understanding how the Middle East functions as a system together, as I was describing earlier, that from you know, modern day Morocco through Iran, there's a part of the Eurasian, African, hemispheric, kind of the land masses and that, that hemispheric system that uh, is coheres together, actually kind of has a unity at this point because of how its position relative to expanding European uh, colonial powers. Uh, as through the 19th century, as France first in, with its invasion of Algeria and then the British, the Russians, the Germans later, the Italians, and then Austro-Hungary into the Balkans are all putting pressures on the region. Here you see 
Um, if we start with this idea of the Eastern question, this is basically uh, the 19th century diplomatic and military conundrum of what to do about the Ottoman Empire, which European diplomats label the sick man of Europe. The reason the Eastern question is a question or a dilemma is that because the Ottoman Empire sits right at the nexus of the entire uh, Eastern Hemispheric trade system, trade network, the linkages between the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and thereby to uh, East Asia, are it, it sits right astride those, especially after the Suez Canal is opened in the 1860s. Um, so if the Ottoman Empire falls, the question in the 19th century is how the that would affect the balance of power in Europe. And effectively, there is a kind of a, a, a ongoing tension that expansion at the uh, into the Ottoman Empire or into this greater is it's going to be similar for to the for basically the Alawites and to the Qajars that expansion into this part of the world by one European power is a zero sum game it's going to be at the cost of another European power and so the dilemma here the the eastern question is what to do with a weak Ottoman Empire that uh, if you look at this map over time, you should look at some of the dates that, uh, you know, one of them that's not on here, but effectively Cyprus and Egypt, the British are going to take in the 1880s. Uh, French, France takes Tunisia in 1881. Um, the Italians are moving into Eritrea, into the Horn of Africa, as are the French and British and, uh, uh, sorry, the British and the French and the Italians are all going into the Horn of Africa down there at that node close to Aden. Um, where the Red Sea would open up into the Indian Ocean. Uh, so the, the Russians are, are coming both to the east through the Caucasus and to the west through the west and in, in, into the Balkans. So they're just getting pushed uh, on every front right there. And it's begging the question where this might erupt into a European or a continental conflict for among the European powers. So this is like a standing tension that exists through the 19th century. The Great Game is kind of the, the, the further uh, Eastern, um, you guys you read your Kipling, uh, Kipling's uh, novel Kim uh, in Afghanistan. It's this, the Russia, Russian and British competition there. So there's the 19th century geostrategic tensions and competition that are these parts of the world that encompass the, the Middle East uh, and North Africa are right at, in the, the kind of bullseye of those tensions. Um, this may or may not be as intuitive, but the scramble for Africa is really also connected to this region because of the fact that both Libya, I mean Egypt, and then Libya and Tunisia and Morocco uh, later in the 19th century are still on the board, and the French and the Italians and the Germans are competing, and the British actually are competing over them. And the last one, the Morocco question, is the kind of a corollary to the Eastern question is the fact that the Straits of Gibraltar are so important. Um, for the east-west trade uh, with access to the Mediterranean Ocean and the Suez, Mediterranean Sea and the Suez Canal, um, that there's a tension over a weak Morocco, and if one colonial power, the French, for instance, takes over it, the British are concerned uh, that they would have the ability to shut down the Straits of Gibraltar. So these tensions really drive uh, the, the dynamics that are going to lead to World War I. Um, but here's where I'm going to take a second to talk about that first part of the interventions. From, a, from the Middle East, the greater Middle East, World War I uh, is starting in 1911 with two things. One is that the French and, and the Spanish over in Morocco uh, do an inland occupation, which provokes a crisis with Germany that almost leads to a, a war uh, between France and Germany on their border, on the Rhine. Um, that gets averted in the summer of 1911, but in September, Italy unilaterally attacks Ottoman Libya, invading Tripoli, invading in the west in Benghazi and Cyrenaica, and the Italo-Ottoman War uh, escalates because the, the Italians kind of take the coast quickly, but they can't go inland, and they move the war uh, in further into the east, into the Med eastern Mediterranean, and in, uh, attacking Beirut, for instance, and then moving towards Istanbul itself, and they're approaching the Dardanelles, which are the narrows that go in to the Sea of Marmara towards Istanbul. And as they're doing that, they're provoke, they're they're kind of getting Montenegro to engage, also attack the Ottomans in uh, in the summer of 1912. 
and the Ottomans sue for peace with Italy, and then because they're immediately engaging the Balkan League in uh, the Balkan Wars. We don't have time to go through those, uh, to parse those out, but they basically set up the tensions that there's a breather in the spring of 1914, but in June of 1914, and this is more familiar probably from our catechisms about World War I, is that Archduke Ferdinand, who's the heir to the Austro-Hungarian uh, throne, that empire, is assassinated in Sarajevo by a Serbian nationalist. Uh, it's just flowing out of those tensions of the, the, the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire, and then that domino effect starts the war. So if you think about the war from the perspective of the Middle East, 1911 is a much more important date in terms of a, the beginning of the onset of that conflict. 1914 is important because it does switch the conflict into an inter-empire phase of war. And here the Ottoman Empire uh, is, uh, you know, we, we focus a lot on the Western Front, but if you think about the theater in the Middle East, it's it, integral, integrally important to the course of the whole war. In multiple ways, one of which is because for the Br the British are fighting this. This is a war among empires, and the British fight this as an over largely overseas empire, who's uh, is laterally connected from London to India and beyond, and needs the transport of troops through the Suez Canal, and has its own kind of regional interests in shoring up its. Uh, if the Ottoman Empire is going to fall, it's it wants to take that part of the world. Um, so the. Ottomans face, uh, if you think about, uh, the France has one front on the war. Germans have two. Russia has one or two. The Ottomans have at least five. Um, one of those is the fact, you know, right at the beginning of the war, November of 1914, the Russians invade through the Caucasus into eastern Anatolia. And uh, through the course of the war, uh, they push as far as almost, you know, towards Ankara and then get pushed back by the end of the war. I'm going to go through this quickly. You can read more about that in the book, but in the interest of time, um, that's one front of the war. Another front is through Mesopotamia because the British uh, with Indian troops invade uh, you know, what's now Iraq up through the Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And between November 1914 through the end of 1918, they go back and forth. The Ottomans hold them for a long, a long time until the end of the war, they basically are able to push way far north up into uh, Mosul. One of the things that the book does more of, and I can't really get here, uh, but I just want to signal it, is the ways that this theater is connected to other, that the World War I needs to be understood as uh, being intimately and kind of relationally connected. That's something that happens, for instance, in Kut al Amra, which is a the, the British worst defeat of the British army in the entire war. It's a dis total disaster. But how that's connected to decision making on, on the Western Front. So I, I want to point out that that's important. Um, and just to kind of click through more of these, another important front for the Ottomans is in North Africa. The Ottomans and Germans are able to encourage a local network, the, the Senussi um, Sufi, uh, it's, it's kind of a proto-state-like network structure. They attack to try to put pressure on the British on the Suez Canal from the West in 1915, 1916. And then finally, the, the one that we do know, probably most people are a little bit more familiar with, would be the east, the southern front and, and kind of the staging of an attack through uh, from e British Egypt, British controlled Egypt towards Istanbul, the Gallipoli campaign, but then also the Arab revolt from 1916, 1917 is an Arab army that's coming up, the T. Lawrence story that you may be familiar with, from the Hejaz, coming up towards uh, Damascus, that direction, and then a British uh, Indian, sort of kind of an empire army that's coming across Sinai uh, and is, after the war, going to basically be on the ground occupying these parts of, of the region. So let me kind of skip through through these next sessions to kind of get, continue with this overview of the different parts, the basic parts of the narrative. So part two is this, in 1918, you have a Armistice between the Ottomans and the Allied powers that signed, and in October, from October of 1918 through the early 1920s, this window opens up where it's possible to rethink and reimagine what's going to happen after the Ottomans. One important stage at which this is being done is in Paris at the peace conference. As the you know the the bottom right picture of the 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 British, the French, the American, the Italian um, heads of state gather including Woodrow Wilson here on the right. 
uh, the delegates to, on the left there in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. This huge meeting to come up with a you know a peace to end you know the, the ideas to just finish war. Um, and as the great powers are coming with that new world order, they're receiving delegations from different parts of the world, including from the Middle East. And here you have different delegations that represent the, the vision for a Jewish national home by the Zionist uh, organization um, Chaim Weizmann presents. Faisal here in the picture um, with, with, with Lawrence behind him and, and the rest of his delegation prevents the idea for an Arab kingdom. There's Kurdish, Armenian uh, delegations that propose a post-Ottoman Kurdish and Armenian states. Iran, Turkey uh, present there. There's also delegations that are blocked. One of the most famous is the Egyptian delegation that's going to ask for independence um, and gets arrest, uh, kind of seized and, and imprisoned on Malta. In that process, the behind the scenes uh, decision making is also happening among the great powers, the British and the French and Italians would be the primary ones um, that are coming up with their new formula, which is to have a mandate system, which is a, is a kind of colonial and different colonial uh, system in different guys uh, that is a, Acknowledging that these peoples have the right to self-determination, that they should be progressing towards self-rule, but then in the meantime, there's going to be a t tutorial uh, British and French assistance, and the British and the French are, are allocated mandates. Um, the Treaty of Sèvres puts us all together, and then here's the map that I, I'll, I'll put this up uh, for, for a second, but just as the allocation, I am put an asterisk here, because this is an absolutely fictional map that will is, is almost from the get-go, not reality on the ground, but includes large Italian areas. Uh, Greek, the Greek uh, army lands in Izmir and begins to occupy the interior, the westward into Anatolia. Um, there's a Armenia, a greater Armenia, there's a Kurdistan, etc. That's a part of that. But in reality, that uh, there's a there's a huge gap between that map and the facts on the ground. And here, it's important to distinguish uh, from the, at this moment, a, a important two different classes of, that are represented across the, the political space of the Middle East. One would be what I'm referring to as settled polities. And these are the basically Algeria, Tunisia, and, under French control, and British uh, controlled Egypt, and British controlled Sudan, that in Cyprus, if you, if you include those, that are from the 1880s uh, forward under those. Uh, colonial powers control, and they've effectively settled them. They're not really in play at this moment. But Morocco, Libya, Greater Syria, Mesopotamia, the Arabian Peninsula, Anatolia, and the Caucasus are totally in play. And it's in that space that, you know, go back to that map from before, that you have this huge variety of aspiring um, polities, both colonial states that are aspiring to have control and local polities that, that are represented there. And so in the early 1920s, the book traces how these things emerge in the early conflicts between them. And here's just a, a kind of a breakdown um, that gives you a sense of on the, the ledger on both sides of that. I apologize, I'm gonna be going a little bit fast, but we can come back to the slide if you, if you wanna look at that. Uh, and that's, this is a table from the book. Um, one thing that's happening through this period too is and this is one example of these imaginaries and in the conflicts among them. There's conflicts between local imaginaries. In this case, would be uh, the aspiration for a unified Arab kingdom, the capital, a kind of constitutional monarchy based in Damascus, uh, versus the Zionist aspiration to create in southern Palestine a national home and a kind of a, a polity that would emerge there. Um, and let me, you know, to, to kind of push out the last piece of this, I argue that in the mid-1920s, the region shifts towards a final phase of intense violent conflict in which you kind of have end games being played out. The, 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 that period where the, of emergence and of the unsettled dynamism is through these episodes going to lock down and solidify. And so again, as I'm saying, war is really driving the crystallization of uh, these new polities. In the mid 1920s, and again, I'm just, I don't have time to go in depth in there, but the whole there's a whole chapter that looks at uh, a kind of fascinatingly synchronic moment 
in the spring and summer of 1925, where in Morocco, in, Kurt, in uh, close to Diyarbakir in southern uh, Turkey, modern Turkey, southern and uh, southeastern Anatolia, in uh, Morocco, northern Morocco, and in Syria, you have sy synchronic, uh, simultaneous wars that are happening across those those different geographies that draw the French, the Turkish Republic. <coughs> Sorry, and indirectly, um, the Spanish um, in northern Morocco, and then indirectly the British are drawn into these really large-scale conventional warfare conflicts that take years to to put down. Um, and then to skip to the the next, the kind of chronologically the, the the later 1920s, there's three more conflicts. This is a continuing of a Kurdish struggle where the Turkish Republic is having to engage in a massive internal colonization, a counterinsurgency, however you want to describe this, against the a Kurdish attempt to forge an ind independent Kurdish polity in the East. Um, and this involves, uh, and this is something about all of these episodes, they involve the extensive air power, extensive use of chemical weapons in several cases, and a kind of indiscriminate uh, targeting of civilians, and also just require the, the massive mobilizations, tens of thousands of troops to put them down. So this is the, the this case here. In Libya, the Italians are set in the 1920s on putting down any local resistance and engage in a eight year, you know, seven, eight year struggle against the Senussis, which involves uh, the extensive use of concentration camps to remove the civilian population out of this region the Jebel Akhtar in eastern in uh, Cyrenaica in eastern Libya, and um, extensive bombardment and just and also the building of a 370 kilometer fence on the border between Libya and, and Egypt to cut off supply lines for the Sunusis. And at the end of that, uh, by 1931, they have captured Omar al-Mukhtar, who's the leader of the Sunusi resistance, and executed him. And by the 19, again, 1934, 1935, they've unified these three provinces of Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and Fizan into uh, modern Libya. And then the last one, before I wrap up with some concluding thoughts about how this connects to the present, is, and this is in some ways the most fascinating one, and it's the most, one of the strongest counterfactuals to that entire Sykes-Picot narrative. And this is what happens in the Arabian Peninsula. At the beginning in 1920, if you start you know, the clock there. The British are backing the Kingdom of the Jaws, the Sharif Hussein and this, the family that includes Faisal, who was uh, with going up to Syria with Lawrence. Um, they're backing the Hashemites in the Hejaz, they're backing them in Jordan, and they're backing them in Iraq. And uh, they also have been backing uh, a, a new uh, kind of upstart in out of Riyadh, Ibn Saud, that is in the 1920s, the, the, the you know, to summarize this real quickly, the Ibn Saud with his uh, a concentrated core power uh, group of uh, fighters that are, are called the Brotherhood or the Ikhwan successfully put down multiple challengers and consolidate over the next a decade a uh, effective control and projection of Saudi power that unifies the Hejaz and the Najd and actually pushes down against Yemen and it takes until the early 1930s in a Saudi-Yemen war that uh, finally gets resolved in 1934. By that point, you've had the forging of this new Saudi state, this kingdom of Saudi Arabia that unifies them, really against the wishes of the British uh, in the sense that, that the British are, are, are very, they're active as a referee or as an umpire, but they're not actually act, uh actively pushing um, through military power there. They're letting the, these processes play out in uh, Arabia, which leads to the emergence of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, let's wrap up and then I wanna get into questions and answers. I can see this like huge chain going on. Um, to sum it up quickly, the making of the modern Middle East was this process, not an event. And here it's really important that uh, to, to emphasize that process was violent it involved the colonial powers and it involved local uh, actors. The other point that I'm wrapping up with this is that this period if to open up from 1911 to 1934 to let it stand on its own, on its own terms. One is to not project back what we know happened, to allow, to kind of get back into this historical present and see what's possible, what's thinkable, and then what happens through time. One thing that's 
you know, maybe more controversial and, and is definitely not intuitive, but I'm strongly arguing that there is not an Edenic counterfeit, you know, like kind of what might have been of these correctly drawn borders. That whole idea of drawing borders correctly is uh, a total myth and is and, and it doesn't make sense in the Middle East and it doesn't make sense anywhere else. Um, how does this relate to today? And I uh, might come back to this in the Q&A about some of my own experiences in doing this research. Um, but ef effectively in the late, in the a hundred years late in the early 21st century, and this is a trip I was, uh, went to to Iraqi Kurdistan as ISIS is, is, uh, a couple of, you know, three miles away from the edge of the, the foothills of the Taurus mountains, um, and spreading the, the control of the Islamic state up that direction. And on another trip going to the border between Jordan and Syria, which is, is it, a highly armed, highly securitized border, which I had personal uh, encounters with, that in this, this fluidity, as you see the map changing with the expansion of Islamic State and the contraction, and also the hardening of these borders, and it's in this war is driving, uh, again, these types of interactions that are changing or can change the map. And my last, and I'll skip this one, but my last point is just to kind of put a quote up here. At the end of the day, the Middle East is not cursed by the great war legacies. I'm arguing against that original sin. And if that's true, then it's salvation. If it's not cursed that way, it's also the salvation is not the external powers or someone locally redrawing boundaries. It's not going to fix it. It's politics is what's at stake. And here, that last line, if we can get back into this moment where new worlds are being thought and created in the Middle East and during the Long Great War, I find that that also opens up the possibilities for right now. That this is, uh, there's potential to rethink, to reimagine, and that there's hope that can, can be, uh, you know, we can kind of end with on, on that, uh, on a hopeful note. All right, thank you so much for bearing with me as we go through that, and I'm really excited to get into the Q&A section now. Thank you, Professor Wardson. Um, a very dense presentation. I'm super impressed, as always, always impressed with our Yale faculty and how you managed to get so much information in such a short period of time. Um, but that's why it's it's truly a pleasure to have these presentations and have access to um, to your knowledge. We have quite a few questions in the Q and A. Um, I want to just start with a couple of points that people have asked about. Uh, first point is, will this session be made available later for those who have to leave early? And the answer is yes, it will be available on the Alumni Academy website uh, shortly after today, um, definitely by the end of the week, but check back on our website um, and you will find a link to that. If you email us at alumniacademy at yale.edu, you will get an auto response from us and there's actually a link to the section of our website where all of our webinar recordings are located um, so you can always watch any session after it's been uh, broadcast uh, it's available on our website and another question people have asked uh professor wurton is will you make your slides available uh, are you happy to yeah share yeah this? totally um i'll try to there, it's a, I think a 300 megabyte file right now, and I will, I will get it into a manageable form, possibly as a PDF. And yeah, I'll totally do that. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's great. If you send it to us, we will post it on the same web page where this recording will be available. So you'll be able to go to one web page, and uh, download the slides as well as watch this session again. And uh, also on that web page will be the link to purchase a copy of the book. So I want to encourage everyone again to, uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat again, but World Making in the Long Great War is the name of the book. Subtitle is How Local and Colonial Struggles Shape the Modern Middle East. There are signed copies of this book available for you, courtesy of Yale Alumni Academy and the Yale Bookstore. And I will share a link in the chat where you can purchase a signed copy and have it shipped to you. So. Having said that, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box. Please don't post them in the chat because if you do, um, that will make it difficult for me to keep track of all the questions. So I wanna start with Kenneth's question. Uh, he says, I remember reading a quote from T.E. Lawrence in Foreign Affairs before the Iraq War that the artificial division of the Middle East after World War I 
would lead to loss of much treasure and lives on the part of all sides. And I want to complicate this quote that Kenneth shares because it seems to interact with your thesis, Professor Wardson, that um, that the sort of European hand in the division of the Middle East is not the only reason and perhaps not the primary reason for the continued um, conf conflict around borders and national identities in that region. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on on the quote and on uh, on that idea, the quote and your thesis being a little bit in tension. Yeah. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's a really great point, Kenneth. Thanks for bringing that up. It, the question of the artificiality of, of the region and how that would connect to a subsequent um, loss of treasure and lives um, and maybe instability. I think, again, it, it, it's, I think it's the wrong diagnosis. I think even on the part of, of um, T.E. Lawrence, it, it, that, that rests upon the presupposition, right? Artificiality rests on the presupposition that there's a natural boundary. And here, I think you just kind of just walk through the different cases that are built into the actual history of the region itself. You have in Iraq, it's artificial because you could argue that, you know, well, it should have been actually small. You should have had a Kurdish one, you should have had a Sunni one, you should have had a Shiite one. There, um, the argument is a, a, against uh, too large of a combination that, that wasn't viable. And in other parts of the, the region, the, the French basically subdivide Syria into five or six different subunits, including a Druze state, Lebanon, uh, uh, Damascus, Aleppo, kind of Syria, uh, Sunni majority area, and Alawite region. So there, the argument is that it was divided too much. And I think, and, or Palestine. Is Palestine a natural unit? What would the natural unit be there geographically? How do you draw the lines around it? Does it encompass Jordan? Is it east of Jordan? Can you subdivide that? And I think you get so many iterations there that it, again, if you step, I think it's important to step back and, and, and think through the presuppositions behind that claim. And that claim is what it's not doing, and, and this is kind of the end of the book. I was kind of, I didn't put this in as much, but my critique about the British and the French and about this, uh, the, the, their input into the equation is not that they're innocent by any stretch of the, uh, the, any stretch of the imagination. It's just the claim that what they did wrong was not by artificially dividing things. What they did wrong was in the aftermath of the war, and you can, it's, it's systematic. I'm not gonna say it's not almost systematic, it is systematic. They systematically intervene and destroy any local evolution of political forms, representative institutions, uh, ideas about self-governance. And, and I'll, I'll, have a sec I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But in Syria would be the, the classic case of that. Um, the Syrians put together a constitution of the Constitutional Convention, engage in negotiations and give and take and come up with a, a, a political system, which is a kind of the result of political prote process among representatives. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it actually generated, it was a locally generated uh, entity there that the British cut loose. They kind of abandoned Faisal and the French come in with military power and physically and violently crush. Uh, Similarly, in Iraq, which Lawrence is talking about in that quote, the, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, in terms of the Iraq war, um, the British create, you know, intervene in terms of how they set up the, the, the state structure so that the colonial states that get created in this period, by definition almost, are authoritarian, not representative, and are not interested in cohesion amongst the broader public. They're, the logic of colonialism is divide and rule. And so, that's the legacy here. It doesn't have to do as much with the divisions as it does with the state structures that got forged here th through this. Um, and yeah, to put that in context of the, the Iraq war, the United States intervention in the region, similarly flowed out of, you know, this is connected to some of the present day relevance, but it flows from an idea of great power, uh, almost omnipotence, that you can just go in and create democracies and create a bash, you know, you can create re facts on the ground through great power intervention. And I think after 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is clear that is not true. So it's a little bit, I, I want to simplify it, you know, really simplify it down and say it's a little bit too many cooks in the kitchen and maybe let 
the people on the ground who are sort of hashing this out between them, the imperial power sort of needing to step back and let them hash it out a little bit more instead of sort of coming in with a deified idea of we can we can map this out and, and settle it once and for all. Yeah, I think there is a conflict of interest that the British and the French in this in this area want their priority as any great power naturally would a realistically, you know, kind of their real politic is that they uh, are interested in their have their own geostrategic interests there. That's not the interest of the local pop population as those come into conflict. And that I think that's a really important point to draw out of. of I mean, I know it's your whole thesis, but I sort of put a lot of time into it because I think it's a key point to draw out a lot of questions around the relevance for current times and how this changes circumstances in the Middle East. But I, I think I think the point is that um, th there's a level of interference with sort of local expertise, for lack of a better word, that remains consistent in the ideology of how uh, major Western powers think of, you know, sort of drawing boundaries around nation states and supporting leaderships, uh, leadership in particular places. That has not changed. That yeah. that thought process, that way of looking at things has not changed at all in spite of, you know, all the things that we've learned in the past century, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I'm pronouncing this correctly when I ask this question. Is it Sykes-Picot? Yeah. Okay. So Ed asks if the Sykes-Picot narrative is itself a Western creation, have there always been competing narratives put forth by those who lived in the broader Ottoman Empire? And uh, someone else has asked, why, why did it take so long to take down the Sykes-Picot view? Um, that's a good question, um, Edward. It is important to, to note, I, I, I try to do this, I, I, but it's, a, it's nice to have a little bit of time to open this up. The Sykes-Picot narrative is, uh, has its Western uh, prevalence, but it's really important to note that it is also the dominant narrative in the region itself. Um, so it is, I, I don't know if the word creation is, is correct, and that's actually a good point. Um, and maybe, yeah, it's a little bit, I didn't include that in the scope of the book, is like how to trace that narrative actually over the past century. Um, you get it, you know, in the early, quickly, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, or just like how T. Lawrence would narrate this, and different actors from that period. But also locally, the the, the trope of betrayal, um, this is mainly on the Arab side of, of that, that I, it's kind of expressed in the, the way that I, Islamic State, ISIS, was referencing Saipiko in their own propaganda, is that it's very much the, uh, uh, the local understanding is that, uh, this diagnosis of this is where it went wrong. Um, and that is a really powerful local narrative. So I don't, I wouldn't say it's not a, a Western creation. It's not definitely just a prevalent creation that's in antithesis to the local narrative here that's getting imposed on it. It's actually, that's a shared master narrative across them. And thanks for bringing that, that up. Yeah, I think that leads a little bit into Barbara's question. Um, Barbara asks, how does your thesis relate to ideas of nationalism with a basis in culture and language that are also a part of the responses to empire in, during this period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, have lots to say about nationalism, and hopefully they'll come back someday and give another talk um, on that. I, I, you know, it's a complicated uh, question about how nationalism works, and there's a lot of debates in people that have studied that. I will, you know, to, in, to, in, in the scope of what I can talk about here, I think it's uh, nationalisms, it, it's kind of like a tightrope. In one sense, they're not absolutely arbitrary and come out of nowhere and have no basis in what people actually feel uh, or, or kind of like a factual basis of their ethnic or religious or linguistic bonds that they see them sharing with other people. Um, but that said, it is also true that nationalisms in terms of what they mean politically are highly dependent on context and they are not, they do not function the same way through all time and in different, in different contexts. And so in that sense, I think what's important is to see how those bonds that you're referring to get activated in terms of a political claim for in nationalism being a political claim that your people, your community needs to have sovereignty and kind of governance within some space. 
Um, and, and this is you know, the debate between like non-state seeking nationalisms, if you want to call that, versus state seeking. But there's a kind of a line where they, they tip into that. Um, so I think that's a really good, important point. And what I would argue here is that this is a really important moment where there's a lot of bonds that are happening in the region. And that the, because of the fact that the, the future is wide open, the ways that they get activated is really dynamic. And there's a lot of potential directions that they could go. There wasn't a locked in single one that's based upon that either ethnic identity in terms of what language they speak or the way that that works with language and religion. That's not fixed and determined. Okay, great. A lot of um, really interesting questions coming in and everybody who's asking questions, I'm going to do my best to get to all of them in the 20 minutes or so that we have left. Um, I want to do one thing that knocks out uh, about five or six comments, um, which is people pointing out that this dynamic um, of drawing boundaries somewhat arbitrarily without a real connection to um, the local influences on the ground has happened in many other places in the world. And so people talking about um, Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Americas and the indigenous populations of the Americas. And there's a question here that I think um, really gets at, uh, I just lost it. Hold on, I'm gonna get back to it. Gets at, I think what's interesting about this um, do you feel that a similar reevaluation? So Charles asked, you know, the way that you're reevaluating the me Middle East and talking about, you know, and looking at it through the lens of a new thesis, <laughs> do you feel that similar reevaluation is needed with respect to Sub-Saharan Africa? That's Charles' question, but I guess I would sort of abstract that question to say. Do you look around in other places in the world and see this same lens could potentially be applied and help us better understand conflicts that remain um, in lots of different places, Sub-Saharan Africa, Northern Africa, um, North America, for that matter. There are, yeah. you know, Ukraine, someone asked about the war in Ukraine. So I just, I just wonder if you could speak about your thesis as uh, sort of an abstractable content. Uh, context yeah. that can be applied to other places. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think, so wait, I'm making a claim that uh, all boundaries are after effects or secondary effects of these processes, uh, like of political consolidation and competition and conflict, often violent. And that kind of at the end of the day, after all that's been done, that's where you kind of get resolved on like, this is where the border is going to be. Um, I think that does hold across most of the world. Um, in the sense like that's the actual story that happened there. It then it's connected to the question like the, that's like if that's what happened, like what should happen or how should borders be drawn um, is is interesting to think about. I mean, if you think about Africa, I kind of think through some different parts of the world that in Africa, the story is definitely the scramble for Africa is that at the Berlin conference in um, 1885, that the, that the colonial powers just have carved up the confident continent and then poof that's modern africa and actually that's not what happened in that conference because that conference says that there's a, a right of um effective occupation that they're basically you had to push into the interior and actually occupy territory to to substantiate your claim there and i mean it is true that after the colonial powers kind of in some of the my cases themselves um in libya the, the border between libya and egypt is forged in the processes I was talking about with the Senussis and the Italians and then the British having to deal with that. The, the, the borders between, um, in, in, in Morocco itself, which is kind of an, another example of this, in, a border that after independence gets removed are these boundaries between French zones of control and Spanish zones of control that aren't mapped at all until they have to with war. And in the South and the modern Sahara conflict of this claim, you know, Western Sahara's claim to be independent, Morocco's claim that it's part of Morocco is actually also the question of boundaries are forced through warfare. And Morocco's physically created the largest wall, you know, berm and, and it was visible from space as a part of that conflict. So I think that this is, is true in terms of the normative side of this. I mean, some of the conflict, comments we're talking about what are, are there like how do you put europe into the con context and i think it's it, it is good to think about europe um what is the natural border between france and germany is it the rhine is it 
something else. I mean, France and Germany fought three wars between, you know, from 1870 to 1945 that had to do with where Germany and France should sit. And eventually it gets drawn where it gets drawn, but there's a debate of Alsace and Lorraine, which are German speaking. It's a huge debate in France in the late 19th century when they lose Alsace and Lorraine to Germany. Um, so those borders in Europe themselves are also forged through process. Um, I'm just thinking in Connecticut, there's that weird bump, uh, the little sm small sliver that goes up into Massachusetts. Like, I don't know actually why that line goes there, but that's not in there. What's the natural border between uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts? What's a natural border between Can Canada and the United States? Actually, some of those borders, the Canada and the United States, the War of 1812 is a war over whether the U.S. border is going to go north. I mean, it's part of that, uh, what's happening in that war is, is the U.S. going to absorb Canada or not? 1848, is the U.S. going to absorb Mexico or not? I'm from Texas. The border between Texas and Mexico actually is the causus belli for that war because the, board, the Mexicans said it was the, um, uh, at one point in the U.S. said it was the Rio Grande. So these, these questions, again, I think are to denaturalize like our assumptions about what they should be. I'm not sure that I have a covering answer that would apply in every single case, but I think the orientation to really investigate these questions historically and to be open to the fact that, that it could go other way. It could have gone other ways in the past and to this point now that it could go other ways now um, is actually a better position than assuming there is a right way or a wrong way. That political process is, is kind of liberating the sense like, well, there's a process. So this could move in a different direction. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I think that really addresses a lot of the questions uh, that came up. I want to go to Diane's question. Um, Diane asks, if your thesis is that current the current Middle East emerged from warfare that continued through the 1930s, how do we understand that reforming the Middle East can be achieved by anything but more warfare? And I want to combine that with another question. Um, uh, Dean's question, which is, if the thrashing out process ultimately results in an authoritarian regime within boundaries delineated by that process, is that regime acceptable because it has emerged from the process? In other words, does a local regional process of defining regimes and boundaries necessarily guarantee a better outcome than an imposed from the outside boundary definition? Um, so now the reason why I put these two questions together is because I think, you know, I think we're all sort of looking at the state of affairs of the Middle East, state of affairs in Ukraine, um, you know, the sort of looming issues in Taiwan and asking ourselves these questions about borders and how they potentially do get redefined with conflict. And, um, and I think we are also equally asking ourselves a lot of questions about the rise of authoritarian regimes. Um, and the legitimacy of those regimes, depending on you know how they arise and and what kind of control they take in these different <coughs> regions. So I wonder if you can just con comment on the idea of what unfolds as boundaries get redrawn, and how legitimate do um, do new regimes become, and why? Yeah, those are great questions. Uh, that's uh, nailing it. Uh on the head. I think um, I, I did want to point out something that I, I, I uh, would, would come back to those concluding thoughts that, that I mentioned. Um, I said that there is no an Edenic counterfactual where the Middle East is just um, left alone in any kind of or that there were natural borders that, that could have just that, that would have been correct. And I think but the other thing that's important there is there's also not uh, exactly, it's not just a, a foregone conclusion like, oh, just let let them work it out, and then it, uh, then you'll have great liberal democratic whatever we want to kind of say is is arriving at a good political system. Um, the cases themselves, right? It, it's not like that. There's absolute black and white story here with good guys and bad guys. It's there's great. This whole, I think, reality history is great, and and it, and that's great. In terms of the United States development, um, if we want to just use fair judging across like where where we sit and what kind of processes generated the political system that we've been a part of, and what kind of inclusions and exclusions are built have been built into our history together, um, to kind of just keep that open and and and, fair, and evenly applied in these other cases. 
But in looking at the region itself, um, you can't go to you know the opposite extreme and say, well, it would have been so amazing if it just would have been left that way. Because in Turkey, um, and this is a question up there that I really appreciated, which I didn't bring in, and the book definitely has it in there, but I didn't bring in the genocide against the Armenians and the Assyrians um, and others in uh, by the Ottoman Empire and then continuing violence against the Kurdish minority, that is a part of Turkish state formation. That's an integral part of that. Saudi Arabia is the other like case that succeeds in this story. But what does that mean? What kind of a state structure, what kind of political polity, what kind of political interactions are there? Saudi Arabia is one of the worst human rights offenders on the planet. It's one of the most repressive regimes that exist right now. So it's not like a clean, oh, what if that happened? Um, I, I just don't, I'm not trying to tell that kind of a, a story. And I think even in cases, you know, you think about what's going on in U Ukraine, um, that uh, I think one thing that I would say, is you're seeing this kind of play out, right? There's, there's a part, Russia can't dictate reality in Ukraine. On the ground facts and the local, uh, polity that's there is important in that story actually gets goes you know violently is getting negotiated right now where should the border of russia and ukraine be where should ukraine exist there's a kind of realist dimension to that actual struggle there's also the normative side that people are asking about which i think is is hugely important like what should we be doing what what should exist and i think here even the way that the questions are being framed i want to move away from the boundaries being the real question at all what happens inside of whatever those boundaries are that's the important story what kind of a political system is is created there and that's the important thing the boundaries are a distraction they're a red herring they're not the real point it's what's going on it's the structures that are being generated in these in these locales and and that's actually really complicated you know I mean, that's a big you know these questions of like uh uh, either in terms of political theory or just the political science or sociological analysis of how you do institutions building that protect individual rights, that protect minority rights, that generate representative structures. That's a very complex, you know, process also. But all of those, those ones that exist the present, we don't, you know, I want to, you know, we have to have a critical eye on our own, whatever your own kind of default is about who, what you're comparing these other, uh, cases against your kind of de facto normative case. Um, obviously in the United States, we're wrestling with a lot of things and, and it's an imperfect union that needs to, to move forward, but that union doesn't really have to do exactly with exactly where our boundaries are. It has to do with what institutions are in, in, our, in our polity. Okay, great. Um, still a lot of questions coming in. And I wanna note that someone commented that uh, they can't see everyone else's question. So you have referenced the comment about the genocide. And I wanted to share that with everyone, if I can find it. Um, uh, someone didn't name themselves, but mentioned the genocide of two more than 2 million Arme Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks by the Ottoman Turks in, uh, from 1915 to 1923. And uh, so you just referenced that when you were when you were speaking just now. So I wanted to give um, some context to that. And uh, I, I want to bring up a comment that's just come in, which is, do you think that we have difficulty understanding the pre-World War II uh, border shifting dynamics because those borders um, that were put in place after World War II have essentially remained static? even as certain units uh, disintegrate or join other countries. And um, the relative static nature of borders and nation states uh, causes us to fail in imagining other frameworks. Um, and I bring that up because you, there's a comment actually in the chat and you, and you referenced it a little bit, which is, um, Jane says, there's so many wars and sufferings as a result of people pointing to the same place on the map at different points in history and saying, this was mine then, and therefore it should be mine now. Um, so I wonder if you could just comment on that. I, I think I think about it in particular um, in the Middle East with regard to the Ottoman Empire and, and predating the Ottoman Empire, sort of the domination um, in the Muslim world of many parts of what we now think of as Western Europe and the, the continuing tension in those in those areas. Um, yeah, in terms of that first question about 
are biased because we've had a relatively stable interstate system since World War II. Um, I think it's a, it's just a, it is an important point. And definitely, you, know, you think of a, over the past century of history, I do see the war destabilizing what had been a relatively stable um, arrangement, even though there's pieces of that that the British and the French and the Russians are pulling off from the, the Muslim powers that are across the southern Mediterranean and into the Middle East. Um, but that goes through this phase of very de uh, highly destabilized, highly dynamic, uh, a much more, the system kind of becomes much more open. And then these new forms come in and, and I'm tracing that middle period, but that by the evil World War II, you more or less shift from the emergence of new boundaries to struggles within those those containers, more so than not. The struggles are, are insights. So like the conflict in, in uh, Mandate Palestine isn't really over whether the borders of the Latani River, it is, you know, you can argue this, or the Jordan River. It's over what's happening inside of what has been forged as that, that polity um, or that, that territorial container or Egypt. Like Egypt's not so much over like the borders, it's just like struggle in, over power inside the container. So I think there is something that's there. Um, on that, the second part of the question, maybe you could clarify is it, are you, are, are you saying that there's a kind of, um, a, a higher intensity of present day tensions and conflicts in these geographies? I, I think about um, the, the sort of emphasis in some parts of the Islamic world on the reuniting of the Islamic okay. Caliphate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this would be, okay. I think one thing is important to note is that there were lot, there are lots of ways um, in this time period. And you, know, you can think about up to the present of, the nation state is not the only option in terms of how you would imagine a future polity. You could think of smaller than that. You could think of like Basque separatism or, you know, any sort of smaller regional, you know, is Cornwall going to split off or it's, you know, Scottish referendum or something. Something that's, that is a more regional imagination of what your political identity is. Lots of examples of that. I'm just pulled several from Europe. Um, I'm from Texas. So we also, <laughs> Texas has an imaginary of like, Every, right. every time I, there's a presidential election, there's a lot of people who vote. And it's like, we're out of here. <laughs> it's yeah, like, I've so spent I, my fair share of time there. So there is like a lot of different possibilities there. There's also like city states, right? Singapore um, or, the, you know, some in, in the Emirates or, you know, in, in the Gulf, you have lots of smaller scale political imaginaries. And but then you also have these other ones that are super national. So like the European Union. Um, something a, a more robust UN or an Islamic caliphate. So I think there are across the board, like the scale, I, I would say as, as a historian, I feel it's almost a liberation to say, well, people have thought the nation state is a very recent blip on the long term hit human history of the political forms that have been available. And so there's a lot of these other ones. And I think that's important back in this period. It's like there wasn't just one nation state model in the Wilsonian moment if, if, if that that was what people were thinking they're actually thinking above at and below that level and and I guess I don't know that that's actually um uh I I, I don't know that I think it's an open question rather maybe the right way to say it whether there's a particular intensity I, I in this in in Muslim majority areas I actually think what's maybe more surprising than anything else is how resilient and how entrenched the nation state is as the dominant political imaginary. That it's just the default for a lot of uh, that, that world that the, like, there's absolutely no problem with being an ardent Moroccan nationalist or Egyptian nationalist or like, look at the World Cup in the fall in Qatar. And there's, there's not a lot of people who won't cheer for their team because they believe in, a, in the Uma and they should be an Uma team or something like that. I mean, it's like, really a powerful sense of connection to that identity. Okay, um, using that as a springboard, I wanna go to Carmen's question because someone else has asked this as well. Um, and I think it's a, it, it both moves off of what you've just said and it's an interesting point to close on um, as we enter the last couple of minutes of our talk today. Uh, when you here's the question: When you're looking at a broader regional picture, um, why would you use the terminology Middle East to refer to a region that includes North Africa? Is it useful to talk about this entire area as a single Middle East, given um, the vast geography that is encompassed by uh, North Africa and points eastern, um, and the distinct histories of it? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I've, I've gotten that question before. Um, I didn't want to write Middle East and North Africa over and over and over again in this project was one of the reasons. And that's ironic because I work on North Africa and I'm, a, I'm in some, way, some ways uh, identify as a North Africanist. Um, but it's a good question. I think that there's not one answer to that question about the Middle East. I think the Middle East as a, uh, as a palpable or as a, you know, uh, active uh, or a relevant category, regional category to pull together whatever might be is actually, uh, it's a relative concept that is more and is less, depending on the time, important. And I think one of the things that, and uh, I could have emphasized this more, is, but it's a great question. And I'm saying the greater Middle East as a kind of, as a catch or a, as a container to, at this moment to say that the, the West uh, in Arabic is called the Maghrib and the Mushrik, the East. Uh, at this moment, we need to think about them together. They often just get totally bracketed apart from each other. And they're not usually thought together, uh, in, especially in the 20th century uh, and somewhat in the 19th century, because they go on divergent, the French path of uh, colonialism and, and the British. Uh, but in this moment, I'm arguing they need to be thought of as a system because of the logics of those 19th century great power com com competitive dynamics that they're pushing on the region in very similar ways from Morocco to Iran or all the way to India, honestly. And so that that system is important uh, because of that, and then through the war, because it's a theater of a global war, and a, a very important one, that it continues to be so. And then even after that, uh, it continues to function as a very connected region through the 1920s. One example would be that when the Reef War and the Syrian War are both French um, colonial holdings, and that the actors on both sides of that are very aware of the fact that the French have to fight on two places, and so there's a lateral connectivity there um, that is, is kind of part of what I'm trying to flesh out. This is probably beyond what we would want to talk about. Um, the Middle East is uh, an absolutely relative term. And middle, uh, you know, what's the East? What's the Middle? What is it? And it is, you know, it emerges through the 19th, in, these 19th century, um, that pr process, and then you know, up through the, you know, the contemporary period. I think it's debatable, yeah, to what degree right now is the Middle East an important term. And I think it's something you could, you could ask, like it's an analytical question, or it's an empirical question, like that would be, that needs, it's not a given, it's actually needs to be accounted for. So I, think, I appreciate that question, bringing that up. Well, thank you. Sort of endless themes that we could explore here and um, lots of great questions that I'm sorry I did not get to pose. I have reposted the link to your book in the chat. And I encourage everyone to purchase a signed copy at the Yale Bookstore, World Making in the Long Great War, How Local and Colonial Struggles Shaped the Modern Middle East. Thank you, Professor Worthen, for joining us today. I want to give you the last word in case there's any any closing points that you I just like I make. wanted to say thank you to you, Lauren, for inviting me. And thanks to all of you for being here this this afternoon. I will get the transcript. I'm not sure I could you know, go through every single question, but I'm going to definitely read all of them. And if you would like, you know, you can find my email if you look at my name at yale.edu. Um, and I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation moving forward. And I appreciate your time today. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you on our next Yale Alumni Academy presentation. Have a great day. Bye-bye.